I'm George Galloway, and I present Kale Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kale Mahorra means free work. That's what I speak. So Kale Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kale Mahorra. With me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, with an audience of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs like me. We're asking the question tonight, when does a Cold War turn hot? Well, the answer is, any time now, maybe even by the time you see this program, because the World Cup has been a cover for provocations before. It could turn hot on the border between Russia and NATO, a border which is creeping ever closer to Moscow. And therein lies the central part of this tale. If, as had been promised to Gorbachev on the fall of the Soviet Union and the subsequent dissolution of the cooperative uh, independent states, the former Soviet states who were going to have some kind of ongoing cooperation which quickly failed and turned in many cases into bitter enmity. Gorbachev was promised that NATO would not move its forces, its tanks, to the lawn of the Kremlin. Gorbachev was promised as part of a deal that he made with the Western leaders at the time to withdraw Soviet and Russian forces from the territories they had previously been stationed in. It was a bargain that has been dishonored. And in fact, over the last 25 years or so, NATO has been creeping ever closer to Russia. And not just metaphorically, not just in the sense that government after government in the color-coded revolutions were changed by Western intervention to make them less sympathetic to Moscow and more sympathetic to Washington and its auxiliaries in the European Union, not just in terms of soft propaganda power, but real, physical, armored power as well. As we speak, the war games continue. War games which for the first time are taking place in Poland and in the Baltic states. Something like 17,000 NATO soldiers are assembled in these war games, which are explicitly targeted at a war with Russia. And for the first time ever, don't you know it, the NATO war games were attended by the Israeli armed forces. Israeli parachute regiment soldiers took place on the western side of this mythical so far uh, game of war and conflict between the west and the east. The Ukraine is where most of the action is. I'm surprised at how often I have to reprise what has happened in the Ukraine. Many people, far too many people, have been led to believe that somehow Russia has invaded Ukraine or is somehow trying to annex parts of Ukraine. None of these things is true. There was an elected government in Kiev. It looked east and west. It had good relations with Moscow, but wanted better relations with the European Union and the West. That elected government was forcibly overthrown in a coup d'etat, coordinated in every particular from the embassy of the United States of America. The president was forced at gunpoint to flee. The parliamentarians were forced at gunpoint to sign documents validating the overthrow of themselves. The parliament was even, as happens 
traditionally set on fire. The very first action of the coup government in the Ukraine was to declare the Russian language illegal, to strike the Russian language from the list of official languages in the state. Well, you might say it is the Ukraine after all. However, Ukraine has a population, especially in the east of the country, where 40% of the people are Russian. They are overwhelmingly Russian in eastern Ukraine, in the Donbass and other hotly contested regions now, but 40% of Ukrainians are Russian-speaking people. Or at least that proportion was the case until the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, the clue being in the name Autonomous, decided that in the light of this anti-Russian coup, they as Russian people who had lived for centuries in the Crimea wanted no part of a Kiev government buttressed by forces so filled with hatred against Russia that historically they collaborated with the Nazi occupation of the USSR in the Second World War, set upon and butchered the partisans resisting Nazi invasion, set upon their own Jewish population without even waiting for the Nazis to arrive. These people were now in power in Kiev. And the people in Crimea decided they wanted nothing to do with that. So they held a plebiscite and more than 90% of them decided to return to Russia. And just one more thing. Crimea had always been a part of Russia. It's now been joined by a bridge to Russia. We in Britain fought the Crimean War Again, the clue was in the name. Against whom? Against Russia in the 19th century and had a very difficult time of it too. Something our military planners would do well to remember. The Crimea was not just overwhelmingly Russian populated. It was, of course, the place where the Russian fleet was moored entirely legally and by agreement. I should tell you that Khrushchev gave Crimea away on a drunken Sunday evening to the Ukraine after I was born in my lifetime. And of course, as both Russia and the Ukraine were in the USSR at the time, it was literally taking sixpence from one pocket and transferring it to another. But if the Ukraine was to become, as it has become, the edge, the point of the spear pointing at Russia, threatening Russia, well, the Crimean people wanted nothing whatsoever to do with that. Everything that has followed is now history. Sanction upon sanction upon sanction, the ostracism of Russia, kicked out of the G8, compounded by Russia's role in stopping the Western-financed, armed, sponsored in every respect, jihadist invasion of Syria, which has so comprehensively failed that they really can't bring themselves to forgive Russia for that. So the Ukraine is the proximate cause of the next hot war. That's what we are going to discuss tonight. Let me throw the bat on the microphone to one of our distinguished experts, Adam Gary of the Eurasian Futures Forum. Go ahead, Adam. Well, thank you, George. 
One of the problems with Ukraine today is in its origin. It's an artificial state, and that in and of itself isn't a problem. One of my favorite states of the 20th century was Yugoslavia, a willfully artificial state, but one which allowed a pan-national identity based on fraternalism, based on progress to foster. One of my favorite current states, Singapore, is equally artificial, equally multicultural. The problem with Ukraine today and the problem with this current regime is that it's taken an ethnocentric, ethno-nationalist, fascist creed based on an ethnicity that no one even knew existed as recently as the late 19th and early 20th century and they've used it to commit genocide, ethnic cleansing against the people of Donbass while also engaging in a brutal game of political football that is far worse than any provocation which we still might see coming out during this football season of the World Cup. The problem with the country is that itself cannot define its own identity. And right now I'm talking about the leaders of the coup, the leaders of this fascist regime. It was literally a place, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, is where the first Russian state was formed in the Middle Ages. And when running away from the Mongols, Russians went to Moscow. Since then, an identity in both left and right bank Ukraine, we're talking about the Dnieper River, which divides the country, had a new identity, which is essentially a mix of mostly Russian and some Polish, some Hungarian when you go further south, identity has emerged. But it was only ever called Ukrainian in terms of both a state and any sort of official ethnic identity when the German occupying forces of the First World War helped to set up the first ever so-called Ukrainian state. Nothing has changed today. This whole notion of a Ukrainian nation was used by the Germans to steal de facto and historic Russia Russian land in the early 20th century, and 100 years later, Barack Obama, Victoria Newland, Karl Bildt, and the other gang of thieves used Ukraine to do the same, much to the detriment of every single person there, including these fascists, who in spite of their wicked ideology are living in worse economic conditions, worse social conditions, worse conditions no matter how you spin it, than they were when the faulty but not wicked Yanukovych was in power as recently as 20 2014. 2014 and now 2018, the same distance of time as that between 1914 and 1918. When it comes to Ukraine, what a difference does four years make? Tell us about this uh, Nazi shadow which hangs over, because they, they get very hot under the collar when this is mentioned. Um, we invited the Ukrainian embassy to send representatives here. We reached out to all kinds of uh, pro-Ukrainian opinion in London, seeking to get some balance into the debate. Uh, but so far as I know, none have taken up the opportunity. Uh, so am I right when I say that the cutting edge of the Ukrainian counter-revolution, the one that brought the current power to office uh, was an organized fascist uh, militia. Absolutely. Uh, we live in an age where the threat of fascism is not only real as it always has been since its invention, but where it's becoming much more apparent. And this I blame on the fall of countries like Yugoslavia and like the USSR, which were distinctly and specifically anti-fascist and actually gave their people something as a better alternative for those desperate enough to turn towards extremism in the first place. But we're looking at a parallel problem. We're in this liberal mainstream media, anyone who doesn't follow an extreme centrist line, which itself has become a form of extremism, is accused of being a fascist. Well, the best school that these journalists should go to, to learn about what fascism is, is to look at the unreconstructed fascism that is on the streets and in the houses of government, both at, in Kiev at a national level and in places like Lviv in the northwest, a former part of the Austrian Empire and a former part of Poland after that. 
unlike the rest, which was traditionally Russian. Look at these people. They're waving banners of Stepan Bandara, a Nazi collaborator, a man whose followers slaughtered Russians, slaughtered self-identifying Ukrainians who fought in the Red Army, slaughtered Jews. They were indeed part of the Holocaust. These people following Bandera are as guilty as anyone who wore a uniform with German insignia. These people are in power. Statues are being erected to fascist collaborators throughout the country. And frankly, the only sane solution I see to this is that a country whose composition couldn't really hold very well, even in the comparatively good times, now has to be broken up democratically via referendum. Now, I'm not one in favor of breaking up nations as a rule, but when it comes to displaced people, refugees like the Russians in Donbass, in Odessa, in Mariupol, these people should have the absolute right to vote to rejoin the only country where they logically belong, just as the Crimean people did. And for those who want to carry on on this weird NATO, somewhat pro-EU, somewhat not path, they too should have a referendum and get the country that they deserve. It's simply not a country I would want to visit, or I would absolutely delight in visiting Donetsk when it is, God willing, reunited with the Russian Federation. Last point, uh, Adam. The paradox that you refer to is very clear, not just in the support of liberal politicians and journalists and broadcasters here for a very far-right, extreme, virulent brand of nationalism in the Ukraine, but given that Jews in the Ukraine are now in fear of their lives from the very sons and daughters, or at least grandsons and granddaughters of those who fell upon Ukraine's Jews during the Nazi invasion, Israel is a big supporter of the uh, coup government in Kiev. How do you explain that? Well, you couldn't really make it up, but the truth is stranger than fiction. You have a Ukrainian deep state, which is kind of fascistic in terms of what it wants domestically, but just good old-fashioned greedy in terms of what it wants internationally. And you have an opportunistic Tel Aviv regime, which is willing to work with anyone w with whom it thinks it can enhance its own regional prestige. Now, Israel isn't an enemy of Russia, nor is Russia an enemy of Israel. They're in fact, good friends, just as Russia is good friends with Syria and with Iran. It might sound strange, but it is actually true. But Israel wants to work with anyone with whom it can sell weapons. And the Ukrainians are hungry for food, but they'd rather spend what little money they don't have on buying weapons. And Israel is certainly willing to do these deals. At the same time, some Israeli officials, to their credit, have said, why are you glorifying Holocaust collaborators? But for every one minor message that some Jewish official from Europe or Israel might say, the overall silence drowns that out. It's deafening in that respect. So we have a regime that glorifies Hitler, glorifies Hitler's lieutenants of Ukrainian origin, and yet is going to be a potential big customer for Israeli weapons. When it comes to hypocrisy and when it comes to putting weapons before the food of the hungry and the oppressed, Israel and Ukraine actually make good allies after all. They're on the same page when it comes to dastardly deeds. Well, I said la lastly, but uh, let me add one. How can the Ukrainian state survive with very bad relations with Russia, an insurrection uh, of offended, alienated, and profoundly disturbed people in the eastern part of the country who want to be somewhere else or with someone else, given Ukraine's dependence uh, on Russia as a market and source of raw materials, unless the taxpayers of the EU are prepared to pour unlimited monies into the apparently bottomless basket uh, of the Ukrainian economy. 
Well, it's a matter of economic survival, which is why the Ukrainian economy today is dying. With every anti-Russian measure they pass, they're only taking food out of their own mouths. Russia and its Eurasian Economic Union just signed a free trade agreement with China that will come into effect in 2019. Russians aren't hungry. Russian, the Russian economy should improve, and it is improving. I'd like it to, I'd like it to improve more rapidly, but nevertheless, it is improving. Ukraine is going to a level of corruption economically and politically that's so severe that one risks, unless the EU throws this life preserver, which the increasingly populist EU voters won't want to do, you're going to see a Ukraine which will essentially be like Somalia minus the nice beaches. It's really getting to that point where a once prosperous part of the Soviet Union is going to become a cold water backland of nothing and just to put a sort of nuclear cherry on this melted ice cream, we've got nuclear power stations throughout the country that have failed safety checks, that are operating beyond their lifespan as legally defined by nuclear energy watchdogs. We could therefore have an ethnic cleansing attack on Donbass inside an impoverished state where people are marching with banners of Nazis, literal Nazis, and on top of it, a Chernobyl plus nuclear meltdown because of the poor state of repair of the nuclear reactors. It's quite serious and it could of course affect all of the neighbours to Ukraine just as Chernobyl did in the 80s. What could possibly go wrong? Answer, everything. With that marvellously eloquent setting of the scene by our expert Adam Gary, we'll take a break and I'll see you right after this. Watching Kali Mahara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London. When does a cold war turn hot? Well, any time now. We took the camera out onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Let's take a look. With the death of Babchenko being uh, fake, do you think that this uh, compromised Ukraine's uh, international standing? I feel the current relations with Ukraine in relation to the rest of the world um, aren't currently very good. With relation to the Western countries, I don't think anybody really needs Ukraine or Ukraine isn't really needed by anyone. It, it, it didn't ring true to me and then I wasn't at all surprised to see that, oh actually he's not dead. And I thought, well, look at what Russia's done with its messing with Western elections and democratic processes. Surely the Western um, democracies are trying to get some sort of revenge on Russia by running disinformation campaigns about all manner of things and I just assumed that this might be related to that. I think the only thing I'd add is that it, it maybe outs them a little bit as um, kind of lying and that that could, that could kind of affect their national standing. People think it might. I don't think it should. It was probably to be safe because it's, I mean, it's quite dangerous to go against the Russian government and, yeah. Not really, no. I don't think so. I mean, I think it was a good thing that he did, actually, faking his own death. I think it was a good thing. Recently, it was, uh, the investigation was concluded that the Malaysian flight was uh, downed by a Russian-made missile. Do you believe that that was provided by Russia or that somebody else might have just used the plans for it? Uh, the subsequent investigations um, point to the Russians being the cause of that missile and the downing of the plane. Um, unfortunately, bad things happen in wars. I think it could be Russia, really. Yeah. How come? I don't know why, I, I just think that all the things I've heard on the news about Russia just lately, you know, yeah. can't trust yeah. them. I feel, I don't know, it's taken a while for the investigation to come through, it's been what, two, three years now? I feel I kind of, I want to know why it's taken so long and what, like, it's a bit controversial I feel. Charles Shoebridge, with your army background, intelligence background, police background, legal uh, background, you must have been as intrigued as I was there uh, to uh, 
hear how uh, people in London are hearing on the news uh, things which they are automatically believing and some of those things are on the face of it small things but which may mean a lot for example the faking of the death of the Russian exiled journalist Babchenko even the scribbles in Salisbury surely a more logical inference would be that the Ukraine is ready to do anything at all to damage Russia whether that's shooting down an airplane faking a journalist's death or attempting a poisoning in the center of, uh, of Salisbury. Yeah, I mean, anybody that's followed the Ukraine situation, and I should say not only have I followed it, but I've visited Ukraine on very many occasions, both from a traveler's perspective, but also I've worked there. I've worked for uh, one of the major international human rights bodies there. I've visited both the pro-Russian and uh, pro-Ukrainian parts. And I would add that that work, uh, I won't name the organization because I don't want to be uh, officially uh, affiliated with them and bring them into this program. But they're a major human rights organization. And that work involved me being there for months at a time. Um, it involved me uh, speaking to stakeholders, that's to say political parties, opposition figures, as well as judges, as well as uh, 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 um, uh, human rights groups, observer groups, and of course, many ordinary people. And so I have that background of having spoken to many different, shall we say, uh, diverging opinions there. But to come back to the direct question you said, which is as a, from a military or intelligence perspective, it hasn't taken a great deal of that expertise to see that a lot, if not most, of what has come out of the Ukrainian government's uh, official mouthpieces since 2014 has been false. It has been demonstrably false. That's to say, uh, when uh, you had it, uh, the person in charge, uh, Yatsunuk, uh, the uh, person you alluded to earlier, because, of course, Victoria, Victoria Newland, the US uh, ambassador to the EU, in the famous leaked phone call that where she uh, swore famously about the EU, but the most important part of that, of course, was that this uh, leaked phone call, probably leaked by the Russian security services, and they did, of course, about everybody a favor in notifying the world what was actually going on there behind the scenes <clears throat> where newland actually said to the uh ukraine ambassador the american ambassador there yats is our man in other words you've got yatsunuk being lined up to take over the government of ukraine at the time when the euro maiden was taking place and this was supposed to be some kind of spontaneous uh unorganized demonstration that's taking place a reflection of the people's will when all the time behind the scenes you had the americans orchestrated organizing facilitating supporting and arranging for a government of their choice to be put in place frequently since then Remember, Yatsunuk and his party um, and his, his government was put in power on the back of street protests. I want to recover, if you don't mind, just go over a little bit of what Adam said again, but perhaps from a slightly different perspective, because we need to look at what the mechanism of the Euro Maiden actually was. Um, remember, the Euro Maiden overthrew the elected president. This uh, was the Yanukovych. mass crowds in the Maidan, yeah? The mass crowds, exactly. But this is a very important point, because when the uh, association agreement with the EU was declined, possibly and probably, I would think, as a negotiation tactic to get better terms from the EU, perhaps, because, as you say, the government wasn't just east-leaning. The government was east and west-leaning. When that provoked demonstrations on the street, those demonstrations were large. They were nothing compared to the uh, previous so-called orange uh, demonstration sizes. Um, then when police, as often is the case, police reacted in some cases with brutality against those demonstrators for the whole world to see. Then you had a situation where for several days you had upwards of around 800,000 demonstrators on the streets of Kiev. These are big demonstrations. But then, crucially, uh, Yanukovych offered concessions. He offered new elections. He offered to uh, undo uh, the enabling laws that he'd passed for himself or for his government uh, to increase the powers of the presidency beforehand. Basically, he agreed to all of the so-called popular demands. But then the crowds disappeared. But the people that were left on the streets were only a few tens of thousands. And I quote from the time, the BBC, for example, which was absolutely pro-Maidan, anti-Yanukovych, pro the Maidan, they were only quoting 20 to 30,000 people on the streets. This is out of a population of what was of 49, 50 million people in the Ukraine. So it was those 20 to 30,000 people that overthrew 
this elected government, a tiny, tiny number. So yes, there were mass demonstrations, but those had long since gone by the time the government was overthrown. Now, to go back to what I was saying earlier, you've got then a situation where Yatsuk was then appointed the prime minister, not by elections, but by the street protests. And those street protests, by the stage at which Yanukovych was overthrown, were absolutely dominated by uh, neo-Nazi, far-right, whatever you want to call them, extreme nationalist, banderist, whatever you want to say, but far-right organisations. And this wasn't hidden at all. This wasn't some scalth coup. It was absolutely clear. I remember seeing mainstream BBC journalists, so-called liberal Democrats, interviewing people on the street about what their hopes were for the future of a democratic Ukraine, notwithstanding that those very people that they were interviewing were wearing neo-fascist insignia, waving flags of private sector and so on, who don't hide their neo-fascist far-right and racist anti-Russian particularly credentials. And as you correctly say, as soon as that government then came into power, and a government, and again, famous pictures of the Rada in the parliament in Kiev, surrounded by balaclava armed neo-fascist militia, intimidating uh, MPs, banning parties, because in the subsequent elections, remember, that you had, you had a situation where uh, there was widespread intimidation against the pro-Russian parties. There was uh, uh, the Party of Regions, which was Yanukovych's uh, party, had long since was disbanded. The Communist Party, which actually would have been the opposition, uh, was uh, technically banned, um, although it still did was able to fight some of those elections. And, um, and so therefore, uh, the Party of the Regions and the um, Communist Party together comprised what would have been the opposition. And yet they had no real fair uh, chance to fight those elections. Russian language uh, television and radio was largely taken off air. Uh, because of the allegation that these were foreign sponsored. And so you had elections that took place, which produced the government, and of course, largely that government is still in power, which itself, the democratic credentials are questionable. But what those, de what those elections did show is that regardless of the fact that many of the high office holders of the new Ukraine government had far right connections, they did not enjoy electoral support. Now, even though, for example, in the Russian speaking areas of Ukraine, you can tell that there was widespread disillusionment because those areas produced tiny turnouts, perhaps 20% turnout or so or less in those 2014 elections, which are the most recent elections. Even in the other areas, the pro-fascist parties that still had people in high office in that government because of their role on the Maidan demonstrations only commanded something like one to 2% of their popular vote. So it's a mistake to think, and I'm not suggesting Adam suggested that, but just in case viewers think that, oh, Ukraine is a fascist country, it is not. The people did not en masse vote for them, but they have power within the police, they have power within militia, and particularly within, of course, the interior ministry. And it's from that, and Yatsunuk's role as the prime minister there, that so much, going back to the, what the person said on the street, that so much that was given out as press releases and so on proved to be false. I gave up at about 15, when the number 15 came up, at the number of times that the West media reported without question that Russian troops were about to invade Ukraine always from Yatsunok or one of his lieutenants saying this. And Which so, has never happened. It's never happened, no, exactly. And, and when you've got... If it had happened, the Russian army would be in Kiev now. It would have been in Kiev within uh, probably three or four days, uh, exactly, because the Ukraine army is a ramshackle army. And indeed, the Russian involvement, uh, such as there is, and we can come on to discuss that later, if you like, came about because the response of the very anti-Russian measures that were announced immediately, as Adam said, as yourself said, that people in uh, Donbass region, around Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, came out en masse and demonstrated. And those were popular protests and demonstrations. And these were not Russian soldiers there. They were people armed with shotguns, with pitchforks, with small ancient weapons. And uh, truly independent journalists went down and saw that this was actually old veterans of, of the, for example, the Soviet army, Ukrainians themselves, who were protesting against their government elected being overthrown. And then, of course, the response was from Ukraine to send down an army to crush that uh, popular rebellion, notwithstanding that it had allegedly been put in place by rebellion itself, backed by the and West. what is the military situation now? Because there's very little coverage in Britain, at least, uh, of the war which continues there. Because if... 
the Ukraine is now essentially an auxiliary of NATO. And if these people are agitating to return to Russia, that's the front line. Well, it's interesting because when you look at the people, there's a big difference in my experience of having talked to many people in these regions between people in Crimea and people who are in the Donbass. Yes, quite People right. in Crimea are absolutely Russian. I was there in 2005, for example. I spoke with a lot of people. I couldn't speak, find anybody that said they were Ukrainian. They all wanted to be part of Russia. When I, before Maidan, when I used to speak to people in, uh, for example, Kharkiv and the eastern provinces, they were Ukrainian. They would say, almost all would say, no, we are part of Ukraine. We are not part of Russia. But what they want and what they wanted after Maidan was initially they did not want to leave Ukraine. They did, they did not want to join Russia. What they want is to have their Russian traditions, their culture, their religion and their language respected. And all of those were disrespected immediately by the new uh, government. Of course, what the situation is now is very different to that because when you have a people that want their religion, their culture respected, which is then disrespected, when those people say they are loyal to their country, but then when that country for four years sends fighter jets, sends tanks, sends artillery to constantly shell and kill civilians in those areas, I imagine now if you ask those same people, they would say, no, we absolutely don't want to go to that uh, country, which is Ukraine. Because when your own country turns on you, of course, you turn the people against you. Whether Russia wants those parts to be part of it is very doubtful, I think. It's a situation that's different with Crimea. But as to the military situation, we have, of course, normally a ceasefire. Um, the Minsk agreements were um, ag ag agreed, largely with the help of Russia and France, not the United States, in break, uh, broking those uh, peace talks. And that is still the uh, eventual aim of the war in parties. But it is a ceasefire largely in name only. Although the front line is not moving rapidly, it is being monitored by the uh, uh, OSCE, the um, multinational uh, in, um, security organization. And they, every single day, you can go to their website. Their Twitter feed is very good. You go to their website and every day they will report violations on both sides. But especially the uh, Ukraine army is still... Uh, shelling civilian areas in uh, Donetsk and elsewhere and killing civilians, which doesn't make our newspapers. And above all, of course, is not just the Ukraine army, because the Ukraine army, as we've mentioned, is decrepit, it is old-fashioned and it is inefficient, and many, of course, defected to the rebel side. The Ukraine government in these areas, as indeed largely internally anyway, is largely reliant, to bring it back to our original talking point, on these pro-fascist militias that are largely the private militias of certain oligarchs supporting the government. And then, perhaps at a later stage, we can bring back that, in some cases, those same oligarchs funding the election campaign of people like Hillary Clinton and who gave donations to the Clinton Foundation beforehand at the time when Clinton was Secretary of State actually uh, orchestrating America's foreign policy in support of that maiden revolution. What a tangled web they've woven in the Ukraine. I'll come back to you later, Charles, about the dirty tricks operations, one of which is entirely unmasked, the Babchenko affair, but which might point in the direction of understanding some others. This is Kali Mahora. اللاعبين او الوسطاء وهل اصبحوا شركاء في الانتقالات الكبرى ولماذا يريد الاتحاد الدولي لكره القدم الحد من مكاسبهم وكيف تجري الصفقات في الكواليس ما هو جديد فتره الانتقالات الصيفيه وكيف تبدلت مواعيدها في الدوري الانجليزي ميدان الرياضه ياتيكم الاثنين الحادية عشرة ليلا بتوقيت القدس الشريف
watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, coming to you from London, discussing the front line between West and East, between NATO and Russia. And it's called Ukraine. We took the camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Let's have a look. Ukraine is becoming a more right-wing country? I have no idea. I personally think right, uh, it is becoming um, far more right-wing in the recent years. Um, it has been actually going for a while now. If you've visited Ukraine, they've been rallying up the younger generation. They've been teaching them and they've been... The, younger, the youths are learning to love the heroes which shouldn't be heroes. about an increase in British and NATO forces in the Ukraine? I don't mind. I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, a very good thing. Our people will keep the peace more there, won't they, if there is any conflict? Yeah. Well, I guess it's always been like this, Europe uh, sending people everywhere, and big countries the same with the US, and sending people everywhere to, to kind of patronise the countries or... And it, it does feel a bit off and weird, but it, it doesn't seem right. But at the same time, sometimes it's useful, and it's, it, I guess it did good sometimes. And this is all over the news. However, NATO coming and building closer to Russia is OK. I don't think that's right. Um, I think it's important that we start to protect Western interests. After all, Russia has been dominant in a uh, geopolitical force recently, especially with the annexation of Crimea. And perhaps they'll go further if we don't do something to defend our interests there. A classic piece of false consciousness there, a man sitting on a park bench talking about our Western geopolitical interests. He probably didn't have tuppence in his pocket, but maybe I'm being unfair. Yes. Thank You've you. got the microphone. Thank Go you, ahead, George. sir. He should have stuck to his first answer, which was, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> but um, in, in the previous Vox Pop, the guy said that the Russia were not to be trusted because he saw it on the news. And as we mentioned, Russia will never portray uh, the right-wing uh, fascists that are in power now as what they are, fascists. But any populist movement that rises up and is sceptical of the EU... The mainstream media is very quick to portray them as fascists. Mm. Is it a case that there, there are good fascists and bad fascists? Mm -hmm. No, that's a very good question. Uh, um, as an opponent of the EU myself, it's been something of a revelation to me to learn that I'm a racist, maybe a fascist, a populist, a nationalist, absolutely none of which uh, I am. So are we hanging this label a bit, uh, a bit too quickly, you think? Yeah, possibly, and I'm not sure to what extent Yanukovych is gone because he was leaning towards Russia rather than the EU, but I think it has to be a factor. I think he was leaning both ways, but, uh, uh, but, but some enough. people wanted the leaning to be okay. uh, rather more uh, extreme. Mm -hmm. I'm not holding any flag for Yanukovych, uh, by the way. I think he was a pretty dreadful yeah. uh, president, but he did have the benefit of being the elected president and not one that was imposed by thug power on the streets. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to uh, contribute? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is um, William Spring, and um, I sort of commentate on international affairs. Uh, it just two things, really. One thing reminds me of when I was in Canada as a student, and I stayed with a Ukrainian family. This was many years ago, many years ago. And they took off, took off the sideboard um, a card showing their relatives, all of whom had died in the Ukraine and as a result of starvation and so on. This was the great famine which um, Stalin imposed on the Ukraine. And I do not think that the Ukrainians ever recovered from that in any sense at all. And I think that drives the fascist groups uh, that took control of the Ukrainian street protest uh, 
secondly, I just mentioned I, I've been tutored on the Ukraine for a short time by my daughter, Susanna, who was in the Maidan, um, who was w working in the Ukraine. And she got there and she said, she was saying, how oh, daddy, this wonderful revolution. <laughs> I, was, I was saying, but dear, it's not going to be like that. But, and I think I've been proven right, but Susanna will never admit it. Um, and it, it was a takeover by an American CIA type campaign by Newland, Victoria Newland. And we should be sorry that an elected president has been driven out by force. I think uh, you, Stalin had many powers, but the, the climate and uh, the creation of famine was probably uh, not one of them. Uh, but the uh, fact that these fascists got between 1% and 2% in the popular vote, as Charles pointed out, is a useful rejoinder, reminder, uh, that just because a few hundred or a few thousand even people don balaclavas, carry weapons and wear swastikas, that doesn't mean they're actually speaking for uh, a, a much wider group in the population. After all, there's probably a few thousand people in Britain would wear uh, Nazi armbands and uh, run around in balaclavas. In fact, I came upon just such a demonstration just the, uh, the other day uh, in central London. Uh, so all I'm saying is we oughtn't to over-dramatise the extent to which the Ukrainian people have somehow that this is a revenge for the famine of the 1930s mm -hmm. and that that is felt by the majority of the population. Yes, sir. I'm Dmitry Linnik. I'm a Russian journalist of considerable experience. I've worked for Russian media and British media. Uh, as it happens, I'm three quarters Ukrainian by blood, uh, but I consider myself a Russian. I was born and grew up there. My mom grew up in Crimea. My grandfather was the mayor of uh, a small Ukrainian town in eastern Ukraine. And when Bolshevik terror came, he fled to Siberia, to Russia, to sort of lose himself in the vast expanses of Siberia. So in my family, it's very personal. Uh, the two nations are indivisible. Uh, but when, uh, well, quite a few people, including actually President Putin, uh, say that Russia and Ukraine are one people, I disagree. I, I, I see there's a, a fair distinction between Russians proper and Ukrainians proper. But it's much more complicated than that, because Ukraine is not one country. It's several countries, at least two. And that's uh, what has been said previously. <clears throat> so it's, well, I guess any country can be described as a country of contradictions, but Ukraine perhaps more than many others. You've got uh, President Petro Poroshenko, and I would actually abstain from um, describing the current government as fascist. That's, no, in no. my books, no, no. too strong a word. For sure. Yeah. I didn't, but any, I don't think. Uh, yes. Um, anyway, Petro Poroshenko has, well, during the past year, I think on at least a hundred occasions, said his final farewell to the Russian Empire and to the Soviet Union. Yet... I think he still has, or and, and until recently had, a factory working in Smolensk, in Lipetsk, and paying taxes into the Russian budget, which is cute. Uh, you've got, um, uh, in a bilingual country, which Ukraine has been and still is largely, you've got Russian, the la Russian language banished from uh, the country's parliament, you're not allowed to speak Russian in Parliament. You're, uh, well, Russian is discouraged, to put it mildly, from uh, the mass media, from television. Uh, and yet you get some of the radicals fighting the so-called Russian aggression in the East, speaking Russian as their first language. So it's a 
pretty tough thing to get your head around. Uh, and uh, the bottom line is that Ukraine is not a united country and the uh, leanings are different and the allegiances are different. And it's not just Donbass, but it's the entire eastern uh, South Ukraine, Odessa, and Krivoy Rog and Zaporizhye, and you know many places, many regions, many big regions of millions of people who are not. When we say Ukraine this or Ukraine that, we should bear in mind that it's the key of government is this mm. and that, but not Ukraine as such. And um, I guess the watershed, the most important distinguishing element, uh, would be attitude to victory, to the Second World War, and uh, to those who fought in the Second World War on the Soviet side or with the Nazis. And that's the watershed. That's what the current Kiev government is celebrating. They're celebrating veterans of the SS division Galichina, formed of Ukrainians. Well, doesn't this put them beyond the pale? I'm grateful for your expertise, by the way. Uh, but doesn't this put them, or ought to, beyond the pale, not just of the former Soviet uh, regimes and, to some extent, peoples, but all of us? Because these people were fighting us, too. They were fighting the British, fighting the French, fighting the Americans. They were fighting the Allies on behalf of Hitler. So how come Western governments and journalists, you're a journalist yourself, maybe you can answer that, how come the Western political class is able to blind itself to that watershed? Exactly. They don't want to know. They simply don't want to know about what Ukraine is really about or what the current Kiev government is about or what the people really think. I mean, they're still saying that Crimea was annexed and that the referendum was a sham, a sham under gunpoint and uh, uh, all that sort of thing, even though it's easy to go there and talk to people and, you know, it's easy to find out the truth. They just don't want to, because Ukraine for them is a tool, nothing more than that, in the geostrategic war mm. against Russia, period. Except we're not prepared to pay the price, as was pointed out earlier, I think, by Adam. Uh, the only alternative to a good and mutually beneficial economic relationship with Russia for Ukraine is an equal and opposite relationship with the European Union. But the European Union is not prepared to, is not able to, no. is not prepared to pick up the slack in that. Absolutely Does not. Does that worry people in Ukraine? Uh, what is also uh, we need to sort of bear in mind is that uh, since 2014, 2015, when hopes were high for, you know, Ukraine choosing this European route, the, the Western, away from uh, this Russian empire and Soviet oppression and the like. Incidentally, I want to just go back for a second to the uh, famine mm -hmm. issue. And uh, yes, I know that millions of Ukrainians died, and it's a fact, indisputable one, but it was definitely not ethnic cleansing or genocide, as Ukraine uh, attempted and at some uh, point um, succeeded in sort of enshrining in their constitution and in some international acts. The fact is that it just so happened that grain-growing regions, of which Ukraine was one, suffered in that way mm. during these terrible uh, years of Stalin uh, reprisals. It wasn't it the forced collectivization? Yes, but that, 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 that took the place Kuraks. across the whole of the USSR. That's Not my just point. Ukraine. That's, that's what just Ukraine. <laughs> of course, the collectivization of agriculture in the USSR, uh, as it was in China, uh, was extraordinarily disruptive, contested, opposed, sabotaged uh, in many ways. Uh, and may or may not have been uh, 
uh, the right thing to have done at the time that it was done in particular. But we're now in 2018, and American, British, French, and Israeli forces are on the border with Russia. Not Bolshevik Russia, not Stalin, capitalist Russia, with a capitalist President Putin, and threatening war. I really genuinely don't understand what that is all about. Perhaps we'll discover in the last segment. You're watching Kali Mahorra. You're watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television. Last segment, let's fire on. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, good day. My name is Goran. I'm a student in international relations. So I'm pretty interested about the concept of geopolitics and especially in the situation with Ukraine. And I wanted to move a little bit from the Holodomor uh, that happened during the Stalin era and try to explain and maybe ask a question about why I think uh, uh, why right wing uh, extremism occurred in uh, Ukraine as well. So basically, um, the neo-Nazis, what I believe, uh, or the right-wingers, or whatever you want to address them, are simply a byproduct of uh, U.S. foreign policy, just as the Mujahideens were in the 1980s in Afghanistan. Uh, basically, what they need to figure out, they're just a tool of the U.S., that this is a power play between two superpowers, one being exactly the U.S. and the other being Russia. Uh, that this is, that Ukraine is just a sphere of influence. Uh, uh, that uh, just a pawn in this game. Just a pawn think? in the game, exactly. And that uh, the small minority of Ukrainians, the right wingers, need to figure that out, because the whole idea, the whole situation in Donbas in Crimea, you can look at it from a realist perspective of international relations, and uh, see that. Uh, both of these superpowers and even greater powers such as the UK uh, have an influence in this and it is the Ukrainian people at the end of the day that are suffering the most. So that's Very well all. put. Uh, let's go to the young gentleman in the middle. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is Joshua Megan from Battersea. I did actually study uh, so the Soviet, the early stages of the Soviet era, era and Tsarist Russia at A-level, but that's history, of course. Um, Despite, uh, despite the fact that, obviously, you cannot say that the European Union is explicitly a fascist regime, that would be too, even for me, a, an avowed Eurosceptic, that is too hateful and too extreme for me. However, we can identify a lot of parallels between what the EU is doing via Euromaidan to the Ukraine and what, uh, what uh, the Nazis attempted to do to the Ukraine at, uh, many, many decades before. For example, if the Ukraine were to join the EU, which is the ultimate objective of the EU because it wants to keep expanding and expanding, so long as you're a European country... might be course, the ultimate objective of the U Kiev regime. Uh, I, I very much doubt whether the EU would accept, uh, would accept membership for mm. Ukraine. Mm. They have enough dead weight around their necks already. No, no it's tr that is true, but the problem is that its skilled workforce, bearing in mind that Ukraine is already suffering from a demographic <coughs> depletion, it's low birth rates, high death rates, its skilled workforce would undoubtedly migrate to Western Europe. Mm -hmm. It would decapitate its skilled yeah. workforce. That yeah. would do its already faltering economy no good. Okay, it would do a lot of damage. Moreover, to, more to the point is that Euromaidan, with the rise of Euromaidan, came the rise of fascists in the Ukraine, or the... Re Reemergence. They were you... always there. But oh yeah, of course. But yeah, the they... stones moved and they climbed out. Yeah, it, yeah, it vacillated, mm -hmm. of course. But uh, the point, the point I'm trying to make is that the what the EU is trying to do to the Ukraine, I think, particularly when you consider that the sole, the, mo the, the principal beneficiary of the EU is Germany, it is attempting to get a stranglehold on the Ukraine and sort of almost Europeanize at the expenses of its Ukrainian. Uh, heritage, Europeanise its identity, homogenise its identity, and essentially, you can say what you like about Russia trying to Russify Ukraine, the European Union is certainly trying to imperialistically uh, also dilute Ukrainian identity, and I think that it, it's, it's very, it's, it's no coincidence uh, 
that um, you know that the fascists in Ukraine uh, want, or at least Euromaidan, uh, want to give themselves away to countries that they have even less in common with than they do with Russia. Mm. Mm. And I think that the sooner that uh, Ukrainians, whether they are ethnically Russian, Russian speaking, or Ukrainian speaking, ethnically Ukrainian, mm. I think the sooner they, they realize this threat, they identify this threat, the better. Well, uh, and that can happen with nationalism. Uh, Scottish mm. nationalists want to leave Liverpool to join Latvia. Mm. Let's uh, take the uh, gentleman at the back uh, with the glasses. If you'd like to make a contribution, sir, you were in the Vox Pops. Tell us what you think. So, first of all, um, I came here, and unfortunately my friend couldn't be with us today, but um, I came here with my Ukrainian friend. I was talking to her uh, on the train up from uh, the south of the UK. And I was asking her, sort of, well, what do you think about all this? Um, how has it impacted you? She obviously uh, moved uh, here, I think it was four years ago, when this was all really kicking off, yeah. um, abandoning the, uh, I don't want to call it, a, yeah, well, the, the sort of country in despair almost at what has happened. But I feel like what, a point that's been sort of glossed over slightly is um, the Ukraine's important... Uh, economic, uh, I don't want to say influence, but um, usefulness towards Russia, of course, uh, in the in the topic of oil, because the the oil pipelines going through Ukraine and, of course, transportation of oil, Russian oil, and Russian gas. oil, indeed, yes, yes. Russian oil <laughs> yes. to Ukraine, and of course that goes all all the way around the world to to Europe and places like that. It's a very important economic. Um, region and I feel that it's not entirely uh, an ethnic um, should we say ethnic uh, mission of the Russians for Ukraine you think it's partly economic I feel like everything's partly economic thank you very much uh, gentleman here at the front you sir All right. um, now I would just like to uh, my name is Ernest I'm doing uh, I'm pause right <coughs> My name is Ernest. I'm a postgrad at uh, the UCL in politics and security, and I specialize. Keep an eye on him. He's a future president. <laughs> I specialize in Russia and and this this whole former USSR region and the Balkans. Uh, and uh, there's a point that was made earlier on that I'd like to emphasize that um, it is true that the these rising right wing moods uh, do not reflect all of Ukraine. Uh, in fact, I am quite Ukrainian myself. I have relatives in Kiev and other parts of Ukraine as well and um, my relatives in Ukraine say that the things the way things are now they were never as bad as they were before before you had a thief now yeah there's a murderer and a thief in their own words uh, and uh, when it comes to the right sector I think the point that can be made about the right sector was actually uh, expressed by uh, one of right sectors figures uh, Koval who said that the, uh, those people who wanted to get into power used the right sector as a muscle to, uh, to force themselves into the Ukrainian government. And now it's like the uncomfortable truth. Uh, they, they're now trying to get rid of them. They now don't want to admit that the right sector... Well, the people who facilitated yeah. Hitler into mm. power had the same idea. He who mm. was this little jumped-up corporal, they could control him. Mm. But that's not uh, so easy to do yeah. once they're in the door, is it? That's true. And actually, I, I do apologize for coming back to Holodomor once again. It was definitely a, a grave tragedy, but uh, something that often doesn't get mentioned uh, is it, it's that around the same time when Holodomor took, uh, took place, um, there was a policy that was pursued by Western countries against the Soviet Union, with whom they were still trying to come to terms with. Uh, they still weren't quite happy with the Soviet Union existing. So there was a policy whereby Western countries, including Britain, were refusing to be paid uh, for the technology they were importing, uh, they were exporting to the Soviet Union um, in, in gold or in, or in money. So the only payment they were willing to take from the Soviet Union was the grain. And so the timing is crucial as well. And that particular year, they didn't realize that there would be such a bad harvest so when it did happen, it was too late. And in fact, Stalin did try to turn away some of those boats, some of those um, carriages that were taking the, the grain out of the Soviet Union. And they did bring some back, but it was a bit too late, unfortunately.
Uh, so yeah, it's not all as it's not as black and white as it seems. As nothing somebody, is. somebody mentioned. Nothing, no, nothing is. is. Thank you very much, Charles. I want to uh, bring this, uh, if I can, to a conclusion. I mentioned earlier that the Babchenko affair, the fake death of the Russian exiled journalist, has given life, let's say, to a new skepticism in the West as to what the Ukrainian regime in Kiev might be capable of. Uh, what, provocate, what other provocations might they have been responsible for uh, and what might they have in mind for the future? And I ask it in this context. It is an axiom that when military forces are cheek by jowl, close to each other, confronting each other, it only needs a spark or a trigger to enjoin them. Uh, and I worry, I don't know if you do, that uh, some Ukrainian provocation blamed on Russia could be a kazos belly. Your um, fear is shared by a lot of people who otherwise you wouldn't have much in common with in terms of people being relatively high ranking in NATO, for example. Uh, people in governments such as Germany, we talked about the role of Germany before, uh, and of course within the EU as well, but for different reasons. People, in, large numbers of people who are deciding influence within the uh, EU and decision making, they look at Ukraine as uh, accurately as an economic basket case. It is a, uh, a place where corruption is absolutely rife. That, if anything, as you mentioned, if you speak to people there, as I do on a weekly basis, has got worse since uh, 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 Yanukovych is gone. But for the same reason, on the military perspective, many people who have to bear the consequences, perhaps, of their decisions, uh, let's say NATO high command, whilst they are very keen to use NATO, uh, to use Ukraine and the people there, of course, as pawns, as you say, in terms of uh, being able to provoke Russia, being able to then use uh, the proximity with Russia as uh, a reason for yet further defence expenditure, because we can say, actually, Russia is um, right on our border now, even though actually it's the West's border that has gone eastwards in a massive way. But, you know, we hear this a lot as yeah. an explanation for why defence spending so needs to increase um, and why intelligence services need more funding and so on. But for the same reason that people in many people, like, for example, I think the German foreign minister at the, just shortly after May down actually went public and said, well, we can't see Ukraine joining the EU for decades because it would just be such a massive drain of the EU's resources at a time when they've got so many other issues. So in NATO, we don't want a situation uh, repeated that was similar to the Georgia situation of, um, of a number of years ago, where Georgia was being offered almost membership of NATO and immediately that emboldened that small country to be very provocative against Russia. And if Ukraine were to become a member of NATO and you've got a situation where NATO um, is honour or duty bound to respond to uh, acts of aggression. Of course, there are many in a country like Ukraine who would, uh, for their own political reasons, would seek to provoke that um, aggression and uh, actually declare that aggressive acts had taken place by Russia when they had not. I think that is recognised by many in NATO, which is why I suspect that for the foreseeable future, notwithstanding that you're going to get a lot of NATO troops, probably increasing numbers of troops, actually using Ukraine as a training ground, actually uh, 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 looking for arms sales and so on. You mentioned, uh, somebody mentioned about Israel, and that is a very lucrative arms supply both ways, actually, between Ukraine and Israel. So they will continue to exploit Ukraine as for its military purposes and as a propaganda tool to show how evil Russia is. But I think they will not want to tie into commitments with Ukraine for the very reasons you've indicated, that simply they can't be trusted not to drag the rest of Western Europe into a war with Russia that would be catastrophic for not just Ukraine, uh, but also for Russia and the West as a whole. And the trouble is that Ukraine again and again, we mentioned about the jihadists in Syria, that they are unreliable partners uh, for the West, notwithstanding that they're used all the time to further Western policy objectives, they have to be kept at arm's reach because they are unpredictable and unreliable. And they, hardly surprisingly, work to their own very narrow interests. And those interests are their own political interests within uh, Ukraine. Of course, those people knowing the far right in Ukraine, that they have so little electoral support, they still seek the positions of power. And of course, you have to 
wonder whether they are taking over the interior ministry, whether they have taken over the militia and so on, because at some point they plan a second Maidan, a second coup, where this time there won't be any semblance of democratic control at all. And I think NATO and EU are wary of that. Well, the United States uh, Senate has uh, just uh, passed the largest increase in defense spending <clears throat> in America's history. America now spends more on weapons of war and personnel, men of war, than the next 10 countries combined. The British government has just announced that it is considering yet another significant increase in British war uh, expenditure. NATO forces are on the border with Russia in Operation Sabre, I think it's called, uh, in the Baltic states, in Poland, on the border with Russia. Russophobia, largely fed by first the Ukraine issue and then the Syrian issue, are filling the airwaves here in Britain. So much so that the great success of the Russian World Cup 2018 has come as a very considerable disappointment to the propagandists. So the scene is set for a Cold War to turn hot, but we better all hope that it doesn't, because if it does, none of us will be alive to talk about it. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahorra coming to you from London on Al Maidin Television.